This game was played in the U.S. Junior Championship in 1996. I had the black pieces. My opponent is a very strong young player who's a friend of mine named Gabriel Schwartzman. I first met Gabriel in Timisoara, Romania, when I was competing in the Under-12 World Championship. Gabriel is Romanian himself, and he has since immigrated to America. He is a very, very talented young player my age, and we've traveled around the world competing in the same tournaments for many years. Here he played e5. This is a very interesting kind of position that came out of a ready. My two bishops are slicing into his game on h5 and a7. My queen is poised to go into the center. My rook is lined up with his queen, so in fact he isn't threatening. He takes f6. Now the way that the theme and the psychological connection is going to come into this game is not in the same manner as last time. It's not that we're going to miss the same thing, but actually what's going to happen here is much more common. Often in chess, for one reason or another, players will be doing very well. It'll be a very long, drawn-out, difficult struggle, a lot of tension, a lot of pressure. And then suddenly, they'll make back-to-back -back mistakes. Like they were playing very, very accurately, and then suddenly, boom, mistake after mistake after mistake. And that relates to a number of things. One is that they share a common misperception about the position. They don't understand the same wrinkle because they've both been sharing an illusion. What can also happen is that they are involved in sort of this dreamlike trance type state in which they are mounting the pressure, in which they're moving with the flow of the game, in which they're both in tune with the sense of correctness in the chess position. And then one person makes a mistake and it kind of shatters the dream. And suddenly everyone is shocked into dealing with a situation which is suddenly much more concrete, maybe a little strange, and it takes a little time to adjust to the new position. You'll see that happen in this game. He played e5. I played queen d3, coming into the excellent central square. Again, of course, he can't take my knight because it's pinned to his queen. Gabriel played knight c4, and now I came in with my knight, knight d5. You can see that if he moves his knight now, my knight can jump into the e3 square, and of course it's a plan for me potentially to play b5 to kick his knight out myself. Now, of course, you see that he can do the same thing, coming into d6 with his knight. This is a very double-edged game. It's also quite important that his bishop on b2 is so locked in. I provoked c3 earlier by playing bishop d4. And you can see the beginning of this game in the database, of course. Here he played knight d6. Now, one immediate response with black would be to move my rook, but I wasn't involved in materialism at this point. I was really trying to get a nice attacking position. I played knight e3. I'm attacking his rook, he's attacking my rook. But what's more important than any of that is that our knights are such powerful pieces. If you look at it logically, his knight on d6 is a much better piece than my rook on e8, so the fact that a rook is in some dogmatic sense worth five pawns and a knight is worth three pawns is relevant, because here his knight is worth much more than my rook. And the same can be said for my knight and his rook. These two pieces are the most powerful on the board. After knight e3, he played queen g3. Notice that my knight now is pinned to my queen. What do you do when the other guy pins you? Move out of the pin. Queen c2. Now I'm attacking his bishop and his rook on f1 with my knight. I might not take his rook, but it's good to have it hanging in the air. I'm also attacking his pawn on b3, but of course he can't defend everything. He played rook f2. Up to this point in the game, we've both been handling the tremendous complications with a lot of accuracy. It's been a very, very high-level game. I played queen takes b3. And now, having given up that pawn, of course he's not going to make the mistaken decision of taking my rook. Knight takes e8. Gabriel's too strong for that. He knows that his knight is key to keeping his position together. He played c4. Material is not nearly as important as activity in this game. What c4 also does is reopen up the pin. Notice my knight can't move because of my queen. How would you handle that with black? You recall last time when it was pinned I moved the queen away. I can't really move the queen to an active square that gets out of that pin now. I can defend it. I played a move which might seem strange to someone who wasn't deeply into this position, I played a4, defending my queen. Now my knight on e3 can move again. He played bishop f3. The reason for this is that it would be very nice for him to play rook f3 to attack my knight, to pin it again. Bishop f3 challenges my bishop. Here I can't really play bishop g6 because he would play f5 and my bishop is trapped. You'll notice that his move bishop f3 had a number of uses. First of all, it got out of the tension my knight had on the bishop because I could do that tactically whenever I wanted to. Second of all, a challenge for control of the f3 square, and also what it did is it prepared the move rook g1, which he might plan later on to pressure on my g7 square to try to mate me. This position is very double-edged. After bishop f3, I played bishop takes f3, and he plays knight takes f3. Of course, you see that if he had played rook takes f3, he'd be giving up the defense of his bishop on b2. And after queen takes b2, I'm up a piece, attacking his rook on a1. So although I said that with bishop f3, his idea was to challenge for the f3 square for this rook, he couldn't do it right away. So I took... He took back with the knight.
Once again, up to this point, we've both been playing very well, and you can feel the connection between the two players. And then, over the next two moves, we both made errors that defined the course of the game. What would you do here with black? Take your time, it's a complicated position. Black to move. What did you come up with for black? This position is very, very complicated. And the move that I played looked somewhat natural. I played rook e6, which turns out to be a substantial mistake. My idea is to play rook g6 next and challenge him here. Of course, I'm up a pawn here. I have very good pieces. My knight on e3 is excellent. My queen on b3 is excellent. He, on the other hand, does have a good attacking possibilities with f5 or with rook g1. My idea with rook e6 was that also I was stopping f5 because of tactical reasons, which you'll see. But I did give him one possibility. My best move here was knight takes c4, a pretty straightforward move. I take a pawn, which is good. Now I'm up two pawns. I challenge his very strong knight on d6, and I open up a discovered attack onto his rook on f2. So after he plays the obvious rook g2, threatening mate, which I have to respond to with g6, then he takes my rook. Of course, trading knights would be bad because then I would simply be up two pawns. Knight takes e8. Rook takes e8. I'm threatening his bishop on b2, so he would have to play bishop d4. And now I have the very interesting possibility of c5, which might seem strange because I'm locking my bishop in here. But in fact, it leads to an excellent endgame. c5, bishop g1. My bishop isn't the only one that's passive. His bishop back on g1 is not so good, and on f2 he'll just lock his rook away from the game. And now I would play b5. This position is excellent for black. His pawn on a3 is threatened, and my c, b, and a pawns will make things very difficult for him. And I have excellent pieces. My knight on c4 and queen on b3, and my knight and two pawns are fine against a rook. This position is much better for black. After he plays the natural knight g5, I can activate with rook d8. Notice there was no way for him to take control of the d-file because d2 is covered by my knight and d1 is covered by my queen. This strange idea of c5 and b5 expands on the queen side and really limits all of white's ideas. And he can't really move his queen either because of the defense of the knight. And this position is excellent for black. My next move might be rook d3. If he trades off queens himself, queen takes b3. After a takes b3, my b3 pawn is just brutal. And b4 can come at one point. Not to mention the entry of my other knight into the game. If his knight on g5 ever moves, I can always play knight e6, takes f4, or d4 later on. And he has the big thing to worry about. Knight e4, for example, is impossible now because of rook d3, followed by rook takes h3. White's in a lot of trouble. This is how I should have played. Instead of knight takes c4, I played the very tempting but inaccurate move, rook e6. That was the first real mistake of the game. And he responded with f5, another big mistake. And thus we feel the theme, the psychological connection between two players. Black to move, what would you do here? Of course, you see, my threat had been rook g6, so his reason for playing f5 was pretty obvious. He needed to stop that. He also wants to begin his attack. But after f5, I had the tactic. Rook takes d6, e takes d6. Notice that I force his knight to leave the board with my rook. And now, knight takes f5, defends mate on g7, attacks his queen, and opens up the attack onto his rook on f2. And after queen g2, bishop takes f2, queen takes f2, knight takes d6. After this nice simplifying combination... I'm up three pawns, and I went on to win the game without much trouble. So returning to this position after rook e6, do you see what he should have done? His best move was knight d4, forcing me to give up the bishop. And after bishop takes d4, bishop takes d4. After a move like knight c2, I can run into trouble after rook f3. Here I can try knight takes a1, rook takes b3, knight takes b3, with two rooks for the queen, but here I think white is slightly better, because of the pressure on the king's side. After bishop takes d4, my best move was rook takes d6. Once again, the exchange sacrifice. Then after e takes d6, knight f5, attacking queen and bishop. He should play queen takes b3. I take back with a takes b3. Now bishop e5 doesn't quite succeed in holding onto the pawn, because I can simply play f6 followed by knight takes d6. Bishop c5 also doesn't do the trick, because with black I can play knight e6, attacking the bishop. And if he goes back to b4, then I can play c5, and then I take on d6. You can feel how strong my black knights are. I have excellent compensation for the exchange. If he tries the move rook d2, then I can take on d6. And the tactic bishop takes g7 still gives me a very good game. Of course, if I took back the bishop, he'd take back my knight and try to use that material advantage. After knight takes c4, rook g2, I have the very strong move f5. 
And yes, he does have discovered checks, but no good ones. And notice I have two pawns and a knight for his rook. If bishop takes f8 check, I can play king takes f8, and if his bishop moves back along the diagonal, say to d4, after king f7, it's no problem for me. This position is very good for black. So his best move would be rook d1 here. Then after knight takes d6, bishop takes g7. My best is king takes g7 at this point. And after rook takes d6, black has excellent compensation for the exchange. You'll see his a3 pawn is hanging, and I can take it whenever I want. I might want to play a move like knight g6 or knight e6 first, just to not allow f5 to lock my knight into defense. After knight g6, for example, if he plays f5, then I can come to e5 and get very active. Here black has very good compensation. Position is probably about level. A draw is the most likely result, although, of course, you never know. It's a complicated game. This was his best chance. Given that my position was so good before, this would have been very good for him. Let's return to the game. So reviewing, we reached this position. It was my move. With the black pieces after knight takes c4, because of all the variations I showed you, I would have had a very big advantage. I missed this. Played rook e6. Now, Schwartzman had the very interesting possibility of knight d4, which would lead to an unclear endgame in which I had compensation for an exchange. Roughly level. He missed this chance to get back into the game. Played f5. And after f5, I had the tactic rook takes d6, e takes d6, knight takes f5. So, while the last example against the Vietnamese national champion, Nguyen, was pretty obvious, I simply missed queen takes rook on h1, this example of the psychological connection between players was much more abstract, much more difficult, harder to see. And truth be told, for the most part, when you're looking for psychological tendencies in your games, you're going to be dealing with more subtle examples. In this game, Gabriel and I both had a sense for the correctness of the position. And while the position was correct, while we were flowing accurately through the complications, we continued to play well. But when the first mistake was played, the second quickly followed, as if the harmony of the game was disrupted, and the players had to take a moment before they could find the beat again. So after knight takes f5, queen g2, bishop takes f2, queen takes f2, knight takes d6, I was up three pawns, and after rook g1, I simply blocked with knight g6, and after h4, I played h5. White has no more attack, and I went on to win the game. No problem. So again, if you'd like to see how I finish this game off, take a look at the rest of it in the database. For the sake of this discussion, the psychological connection between players, I want to give you one last piece of advice. If you're playing a chess game, and you're within the rhythm of the game, and suddenly that rhythm changes, you're jolted out of it. Maybe your opponent shocks you with a decision. Or maybe you miss a move. Or maybe you find something very exciting. Somehow you're moved out of your clarity. It's very important in that moment not to just react. I've seen players who react in hilarious ways. Some people, for example, when they're surprised, when they're out of rhythm, they immediately start trading pieces without even thinking about things. They will feel good about the game, suddenly they're surprised, and then they'll trade rooks, trade knights, trade queens. It doesn't matter what the position is, they'll trade off as if they're trying to find home. They're trying to find safety in trading material. Some players will offer a draw the second something happens. When you're playing a hard chess position, you'll have an intuitive sense for what is correct in that position. A lot of the time, because chess is a human sport, one of the players will deviate from the correct path. Something will be done which is not objectively the best. This is what adds to the excitement of the game. This is what makes chess what it is. Chess is not about perfection. It's about profound struggle and artistry. So, when you're jolted out of clarity, that's part of the game. Take a deep breath, be present, and find the best move. And when you feel like there's a blind spot, a lot of the time when you have these moments of chess blindness, when you and your opponent are both missing something, or maybe when you're the only one missing something, you can usually have a sense, you feel like there's a strange cloud in the back of your head, like you're looking at the game through a dense fog. When you feel that way, do something to snap out of it. Don't let it defeat you. Don't let it govern your play. It's very easy to become resigned to the fact, oh, I felt bad, now my head felt heavy. I had eaten too close to the game, some people will say, and sometimes that's very true. You have to watch out for problems like that. But if you make that mistake, if your chemistry is a little bit off, don't give in to it. Do something to change your chemistry. Wash your face. Jog up a flight of stairs. Refresh yourself. Come back to the moment. Don't play the game in a cloud.